Acts chapter 18. Where did God read? After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. He found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus. They had come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. He departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Cephas, the uh, chief ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak. And hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. No man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat saying, This fellow persuaded men to worship God contrary to the law. And with Paul, who now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks, chief rulers of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of these things. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17 was read in your hearing. Let us now read together our preparation for the word of God this morning. Let's read. All the scripture is desired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. Lord, may I hear and receive your word today. In this, the 18th chapter of Acts, we find Paul working for a year and a half in Corinth. Corinth was not like Athens. In fact, it was different from most other cities Paul had visited. Yet, it was receptive to the gospel. And Paul spent the first long period of his missionary career in the city. Later, he would spend a much longer time in Ephesus. I want to give you, first of all, three words that will help you remember what Corinth was like. They're easy to remember because Corinth begins with the letter C, and each of these words also begin with the letter C. The first word to help us describe Corinth is cosmopolitan. Corinth was a cosmopolitan city. Cosmo cosmopolitan city because it contained a mixture of people and races. Now this was not true in all the cities that Paul had visited. Though Corinth was in the Roman world of that time, Corinth was the major city that had a great mixture of individuals. 
If you remember in Antioch, from which Paul had started out his second missionary journey, this was mostly a Roman city. Philippi was a Roman colony that had been settled by Roman soldiers. Athens was a city full of intellectuals. Other cities tended to be more Roman than they were Greek, but not so in Corinth. Corinth had this mixture of people because it was a seaport city and its work was mainly in commerce. And as a result, people from all the known world came to Corinth to make money. Corinth was like in this respect because it was like most cities that we know in these United States. Most of our great metropolitan cities have mixtures of people, classes, and races. People from all around the world studying in our colleges and universities. People of various races, each trying to maintain their own ethnic traditions. People from different classes of society living together. The second word that will help us to remember something about Corinth is the word commercial. Every city had its commercial aspects, and of course, Corinth had is. Generally, cities were located conveniently according to its major trade of exchange. Well, Corinth was not such a place. It was situated on a narrow itmus between the upper and the main part of Greece. And because this isthmus was very narrow, traffic had to cross Corinth in two directions. Now this was a difficult uh, 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 exchange. They would travel by sea till they got to this isthmus, which is a narrow strip of land, and they would unload the cargo, carry it by uh, land across this narrow patch of land where another ship would be waiting on the other side and they would load it again for it to go to its destination. And this was the way that they would cross and so Corinth became a commercial city where these commercial ships would come from one part of the world to get to the next part of the world and they would make port there and transfer their goods to the other side of Corinth where they would be taken to their destinations. And then our last word to help us to remember Corinth is the word corrupt. Corrupt. In the ancient world, the name Corinthian was synonymous with perverted behavior. Corinth was a center of cults, a beloved goddess, it was named after Venus. Venus, the great Roman love goddess. The temple of Venus was located in Corinth. One of the architectural wonders of the world at that time. And at that time, history tells us that there were a number up to 10,000 temple prostitutes. They did business with sailors and other commercial people who would pass through the town. If you were called a Corinthian in the ancient world, you would have regarded that name as an insult. Those two words help us to remember cosmopolitan, commercial, corrupt. This is where Paul is at. Now our subject is dealing with discouragement as we find the faithfulness of God, which lead us to ask the question, was Paul discouraged at this point in his ministry? What was going on in Paul's frame of mind? I asked whether Paul, this strong man of God that he was, was he discouraged? I believe he was. There's not a great deal that's said about it, but I think as I look back what had happened to him 
in the days leading up to his arrival, and also at the way he conducted himself when he got to Corinth, that he was possibly very discouraged. Let me name you a few of the uh, situations that he was facing. First of all, he was facing great difficulties. Paul had had a rough time on both his first and his second missionary journey. He had been opposed virtually everywhere he went. And instead of the opposition decreasing, it was increasing. At the very beginning, when he crossed Cyprus, there is no mention of any real trials or he was not opposed strongly after he left the cities in his first missionary journey. The same thing happened when he went to Iconium at Lystra. That's when the opposition began. Outright physical abuse. If you recall, it was at this place that he was stoned. Stoning was a way, a stoning was meant to kill the victim. When those who were with Paul saw him fall under this barrage of missiles, stone missiles, they must have thought that his missionary journeys had come to an end and that indeed Paul was dead. But after they had left and went back to their city, Paul arose and went back into the city with the brotherhood. This may mean that God had miraculously healed them though the text does not say so explicitly. But things changed on his second missionary journey when Paul went to Philippi. He was whipped. This was the first of several experiences of him receiving cruel treatment under the Roman government. He and Silas, you remember, was thrown into prison. This was the first time Paul was in prison simply for his testimony, for his faith. And it was fresh from this experience that he had passed down the coast from Philippi to Thessalonica, where he ended up in Berea, Athens, and finally at Corinth. I'm sure Paul didn't say this, but as I look at what had happened to him, I would have no doubt thought, God, I didn't sign up for all of this. I had a perfectly good life in Jerusalem. Why do I have to go through all of this simply by serving Jesus? He had great difficulties in these cities simply for preaching the gospel. He also had experience, if you remember from a couple weeks ago, he didn't have a whole lot of positive results in Athens. He's just left Athens. And remember, the previous cities, when he would leave, a church was founded. But when we studied this account in Athens, in the last chapter, 17, we have to be very careful in how we evaluate what took place. The academic address that Paul gave to the intellectuals, if you remember, was one of the sharpest messages that has ever been recorded in the New Testament. It showed his keen mind, his ability to work words and to work the culture in any situation. Only somebody with Paul's training could have given such an address as he did at Mars Hill. But when we come to the end of the story in chapter 17, we find that only few believe. Nothing is said about a church being founded in Athens. Now we know in time that a church was founded in Athens and it endured for many years. But when Paul left Athens and went on to Corinth, we find him doing it alone in chapter 18. And he must have had a sense of failure. He must have had a sense of not completing his assignment. At least he must have been disappointed for what he had done in Athens. He hadn't borne really any evidence of the blessing of God. And I also think that Paul must have been a little disappointed 
in his address that he gave to the people in Athens. Because when I read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, as he writes back to the church in Corinth, he begins his letter by simply saying, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom of speech. I proclaim to you simply the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. There is a sharp contrast between the address that he gives in Athens and what he presents when he gets to Corinth. There were great difficulties there was meager results in Athens. And then once again, we find Paul alone. Remember, he had left his co-workers in Macedonia, and he had left them for good reason. He had founded churches there, and he had to leave and move on. He was unable to teach the converts there. And obviously, they needed teaching. So Silas and Timothy, they were left to teach them. And it was the right thing to do. But nevertheless, having left Silas and Timothy and having gone on as he felt called to do, Paul was simply alone. Some people apparently do well being alone. That's why we call them loners. But it's hard to be alone. And it's especially hard when you're trying to accomplish some important work or tackle some particular difficult assignment, Paul must have felt a little depressed because he was all alone once again in another big city. And then there was the issue of lack of funds. Not only the experiences that he had had when he came to Corinth must have weighed on him heavily, but also the difficulties once he got there. We can learn a great deal about Paul's condition as we read this chapter very carefully. The first thing we're told in this chapter right away in verse 2 is that Paul met a certain Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had originally come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And that he had teamed up with this Jewish couple. Why? Because they were tent makers. And the verse tells us that he worked with them in their business, helping them in their business. And no doubt he did this in order to support himself. Even today, in, even, in evangelical missionary circles, when support isn't there for missionaries on the foreign fields, we're told that they often become very discouraged and depressed. Paul has great difficulties. Meager results in Athens. He's alone. And then there is the lack of funds. But it doesn't stop there. Paul experiences much rejection at the synagogue. Paul had other difficulties. We read that when he went to the synagogue, he had very little success. Verse 4 says, Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. Verse 5 adds, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. The next verse shows the discouraging result. The Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, so much so that he eventually shook out his clothes in a symbolic protest saying, your blood be on your own hands. I am clear of my responsibilities to you. From now on, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And as we shared last week, that he was referring to the Gentiles in that city at that time. Because we know that Paul's policy had always been, first of all, to go to the synagogue. First of all, for the Jews, and then to the Gentiles, according to Romans 1 and 16. He had a special concern for his people. He prayed for them. Yet in spite of his prayers, and in spite of his ministry, and in spite of his knowledge of the Scriptures, and his ability to expound to them clearly, very few Jews believed. Perhaps none of them believed. He was rejected in the synagogue. He also 
finally received a lot of abuse from the Jews. Not only did Paul fail to have success in his approach to the Jews through the synagogues, he actually got abused from his own people. If Paul had no excuse before, he had one now to say, I'm going home. He could have simply said, look, not only am I rejected by my own people, not only do they in turn turn away from Christ, they don't even give me an audience and they are very abusive to me. I've gone through this before. Remember, this is his second missionary journey. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And no doubt he thought they will begin to stir up the Gentiles against me. If Paul had fears like that, they were not idle. Because the latter half of the story tells us that this is precisely what his opposition in Corinth did. Or at least they tried to do. Paul was discouraged. He was discouraged. He had great difficulty. He was going through great, great situations. He didn't receive the results that he thought he would receive. He was alone. He was by himself. In a physical sense, there were great lacks of funds. He had rejection in the, in the synagogues. And he received great abuse from the Jews. Now, my message is not to focus in on the discouragement that Paul had, but I want us to see the faithfulness of God to his servant in the midst of times when they are discouraged. There may be someone today, for whatever the reason is, you find yourself discouraged. It may be a mild discouragement, it can be a, a, a very small discouragement, or it could be strong, overwhelming to some point. The point is, we want to encourage you to continue to look for God in the midst of discouraging times. Amen. Because that's just what happens to Paul. God sets in some things in place by his providence. First thing I want us to know is that God finally sends Silas and Timothy from their work in Macedonia to finally meet up with Paul. It's not by coincidence that they finally finish and they find themselves where Paul is by God's providence. Paul had carried on the work alone in Athens. Now he was trying to carry on the work alone in Corinth. That gets to you after a while. You try to be strong and stick it out, tough it out. But it gets to you after a while. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we believe we can carry it on. We got to be strong for the sake of the cause. Yeah. But it only lasts for a while. Amen. The bottom line is that one of the songs that we heard this morning, we need each other. Amen. We need the strength from one Amen. another. We need the prayers from one another. Amen. We need the encouragement that Amen. comes from one another. Amen. That's one reason why God has given us what we call the institution of the church. Mm -hmm. It's why we have established Plurality and leadership in the church. That's why the scripture encourages us to gather together as often as we can simply for the sake of encouragement. Amen. Paul had gone alone to too many cities to do the work. And God knew that he needed help. So therefore, God puts on the heart of Silas and Timothy, it's time for us to meet up with Paul. And so when Paul is in his discouraging moment, Silas and Timothy show up. They show up from Macedonia to help him. And when you see somebody who seems to be doing a good work, but who perhaps is carrying on a little bit too much, that's when we need to encourage the most. Amen. Do what you can to encourage people. Amen. You never know what people are going through. So Amen. True. We look well on Sunday. We put on our best and we put on our smile. And Amen. No one knows really how long it takes us to get out the car. Oh, Jesus. How long it takes us to walk to the door. Hey, hey. And we stand there at the door to put on our face and our facade. So when we open it, we give the impression that all is well. <laughs> but we must from time to time encourage those, and especially those who work in the ministry, encourage them continue on their work. God sends Silas and Timothy. Jesus. 
And then God sends help financially. God sends help financially. I, you know, people can say what they say, but when you without funds, when you low without funds, I'm telling you, the enemy works on your heart and your mind. Amen. Now, 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 some of us really don't know about that because uh, we all wish we had more than what we have, but there are some who have much less than some of the rest. And, 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 and making it just from day to day, week to week, can become overwhelming. This is the way it was with Paul. Silas and Timothy show up. They show up from Macedonia and they bring financial help from the Macedonian churches. In 2 Corinthians, Paul said, the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. And he's talking about the church at Philippi. He's talking about the church that was at Thessalonica and perhaps from Berea. They sent financial help. Paul is out there on his own and his resources are running low to the fact that he has to take up a job in tent making. What if he doesn't make enough tents? What if the business is slow? What if he can't buy food for himself or pay for his lodging? Yet has to go to work and as time permits he has to spread the gospel. So the word got, let's take up a collection for Paul. This wasn't nothing but God. God put it on the heart of the saints at Philippi and Berea. Let's take up a collection for Brother Paul. And Silas and Timothy, we're going to send you to take it to him. So they sent Paul some money. <coughs> I think that's the way it happened in Acts chapter 18 verse 9. Now he no longer has to work at tent making and he can give his full attention to preparation for spreading the gospel. The financial help released him to do what he was called to do by God. Then I find God blessing this missionary activity. Although Paul had great success through his initial preaching in the synagogue, God now began to give him fruits for his labor. We are told about Cyprus, verse 8, Cyprus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord. It's nothing like having somebody to come to know the Lord to encourage you in your work. Here was a Jewish believer. Cyprus is not his Jewish name, but he must have been a Jew since he was the leader of the synagogue. Then in the same verse we're told, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. They believed according to verse 7. It had been a slow start, but now the word of God was beginning to take effect. The Holy Spirit was blessing him. And men and women were being saved. So we're beginning to see people who have faith in Jesus Christ. Not only did he have physical help, Silas and Timothy made their way. Not only did he receive financial help, but now God is blessing the ministry and souls are being added. And then finally, I want you to know one last thing God did to really encourage Paul. God spoke to him. God spoke to him. And notice what God said, that there would be great blessings in the work in the city of Corinth. Each part of what God said deserves special attention. But your Bible is open to the 18th chapter. First of all, look with me at verse number 9. God tells him, do not be afraid. What? Paul? Paul afraid? Could Paul who stood up to a stoning, who allowed himself to be beaten, who sang songs of praise while in stocks in the prison in Philippi. Be afraid? Yes. You must have been afraid because God doesn't waste words. God was telling him not to be afraid. So if God was telling him not to be afraid, it must be our conclusion that he was afraid. All right, Jim. 
Paul oh, must have been afraid because of the hostility of the Jews and because of what might happen to him based upon his previous history. So God tells him, do not be afraid. And in verse 9, we get our next clause. He said, keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Why these words? Well, speaking is what Paul did. Talking is what Paul did. That was his calling. How could Paul do anything but keep on speaking? Obviously, he must have been tempted to stop. In his situation today, we might think that, that, that he had been preaching and he could take a break. God hadn't told him to take a break. All right. Perhaps he may have been trying to find another methodology, maybe another method of doing things, maybe another method of, another method of getting the, the word across. You see, we, we find that in our society today. Let's see if we can get the gospel out another way. How can we bring a little entertainment, a little ease? I don't have to put myself out on the limb. I don't have to put myself out there like that. God said, don't stop speaking. Don't stop talking. Continue to preach the word and give people the word of God. So we bring in new, new devices today, especially when it seems like it's not working. <laughs> when people are not interested in just going through the Bible, looking at verse upon verse and, and exposition of scriptures and, and you come to Bible study, there's five or six people there and it seems like just little to no interest. You know, the thought comes to your mind, well, maybe you need to try something different. Maybe you need to do something a little bit different, just to see. That's when you are trying to appease to the people, <laughs> that's right? Amen. Rather than hearing what God says, God tells Paul, "Don't stop speaking," because he was tempted to stop, Jesus. try something else. And then God tells him something else in verse, in verse ten, which helps me understand why He told him not to stop speaking. God says. I am with you. Amen. You get that? Amen. What does he say? I am with you. Now, 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 I want y'all to say that because somebody's in here today is discouraged. Is discouraged. Mm -hmm. Somebody today is discouraged. For whatever reason, because of the unknown, whatever you're going through, somebody's feeling a little down in the spirit. I want you to say these words with me. God says, I am with you. With you. This was what Paul needed to hear. This is what Jesus had said to his disciples in the Great Commission. And I'm sure Paul recognized these words as coming from Jesus. Matthew 28 and 20, Jesus says, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Somebody needs to hear that. Amen. Did Paul ever find himself wondering if God was really with him? I think he probably did. I think he probably asked himself, am I in the will of God? Am I really doing what God has asked me to do? Because if God had asked me to do this, then I wouldn't be experiencing all of this negativity. Now he's reminded that God is with him even in the midst of his trials. Just like you and I, we need to remind ourselves that God is with us. God said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. God said it. It has to be true. And at the same time, I wonder if in his discouragement, Paul did not also feel abandoned. As the enemy would have us think sometimes that God has left us. We are not in his will because if we were in his will, we would not be going through this. We would not be feeling what we're feeling and experiencing what we're experiencing. There are too many other Christians around and experiencing too much positivity. Everything seems to be flowing and going their way. And if you were only in the will of God, you wouldn't be going through what you're going through. But God tells yeah, all, I'm with you. Yes, you loan money, you don't have no money, you got to work, and then at night you got to preach. You're all by yourself. Guess what? I'm yet with you. And don't stop doing what I told you to do. Yeah, I know you got to work 12 hours, 10 making, but when you're over your shift, go out and preach. That's what I called you to do. I'm with you. God tells me something else. Look at verse 10. Don't, don't, don't jump out of verse 10 yet. Notice what he said. He said, no one is going to attack and harm you. 
The same sort of trouble that Paul had experienced in Philippi. Thessalonica. God says no one is going to harm you. We read in the next verse, in verse 12, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the court. They tried to hurt him, but they failed. God had an official in Corinth. He was a wise administrator, a wise mayor. And he recognized that this was not a matter of civil jurisdiction. It was a dispute among religious people. So he wisely and properly threw the case out of court. They tried to get it, but God had already promised them, and nobody gonna hurt you no more. Mm -hmm. Nobody gonna hurt you in this city. Nobody. Why? Look at verse 10 once more. He said, Why? Because I have many people in this city. I have many people in this city. I got somebody that needs to hear what you got to say in this city. There's somebody who needs to hear what you got to say. Of all the things God said to Paul, remember this is a vision Paul is seeing. He's in a vision and God is telling him this. Of all the things that God is telling him, this is the most important. What people is God talking about? It was not the ones to Paul, to whom Paul had already spoken to. The few who had already believed because there were not many of them. Only a few. If God said, if God had simply said, I have many people in this city, then maybe he might have taken that. But God says, I have many people in this city. Who's God talking about? They were people that God would move upon the heart of the apostle to teach and preach, who from that time on who would believe in coming to the family of God. Immediately after having received this word from heaven, we read in verse number 11, so Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. Now you know that wasn't Paul's pattern. Paul's pattern was to get it and leave. He come in, stay a little short time, and then move on. But God says, I got many people for you, so you got to stay. You got to stay here. He spent a year and a half before he moved on. But as soon as God spoke to him, Paul changed his tactics and stayed on. Do you know what happened? People believed. And people came to Jesus Christ. Moreover, his experience in Corinth was such a turning point in his ministry that it affected Paul from that moment on. Because the next place he's going to go, he's going to go to Ephesus, and he's going to spend two years in Ephesus. And then he's going to be in prison at Caesarea, for two more years. And finally, on his last missionary journey when he goes to Rome, he's going to spend several years in prison there. Paul was no longer this missionary traveler just staying a day or two or a week. When God told him, I got many people in this city. Paul changed his whole tactics. Now, this is one of those texts that you really can't take everything and transfer it to your own self. As if God is saying the same identical things to us. You can't just lift chapter 18 verse 1 through 17 and just put us there or make it applicable to us. I don't believe no one is really attacking us for the sake of the gospel. I don't believe no one is going to harm us because we say we're Christians now. Now, I believe the way things are happening in our government is going to be really hard in the church. I, I, I don't know how many of you all keep up with what's happening in our land today. The, the fight in the court now is over whether or not religious institutions will be tax exempt. That's the biggest fight. And many of us don't know where this is in court right now. And if they pass this, it's going to be the beginning of an onslaught against churches. We get into the point where in America what we believe is going to be challenged. Churches in America today are already being challenged by the whole issue, the whole homosexual issue. We're going to be challenged regarding what we believe. But right now we're not there. Right now you're not harmed because you come to church. But I can't help believe that God has placed us in certain places certain situations, and sometimes we get tired of those situations, and we get tired of those people. Mm 
And we get discouraged because we want something better. And what I hear from God today is to stay put and watch me work in the midst of your situation until I change your situation. Our job is to keep on keeping on. Our job is to be faithful. Our job is to be a witness no matter where we're at. And to let our light shine in the midst of low money, being alone, having all kinds of difficulties. God never said it would be easy. No, he never said it would be easy. You've been watching too much TV, church on TV. And they tell you on TV, it's easy. The only thing you got to do is send me $100. God never said it was going to be easy. In this lifetime, we will have difficulties. But you and I must believe that God is on our side. Now, as I told you last week, I want to I wanna close today with... I want to give you some steps in how to deal with discouragement. <clears throat> and then I'm going to give you what's on the outline. Okay, so you can move away from the outline for a minute. I haven't forgotten the outline. But I want to, I, but I want to give you how do we deal with discouragement? Because if you like me, you've experienced discouragement, and you will experience it again. The enemy knows this. Now remember from what we learned last week, we gave you the definition of discouragement. Remember, discouragement was to deprive of what? Confidence, hope, or spirit. We talked last week about the three stages of discouragement. Remember, mild discouragement were those minor problems or pressures which affect our emotions. Remember, we talked about strong discouragement, major problems or pressures which affect our spirit so to the point that others notice that we're going through things especially those who are closest to us. And then we talked about disabling discouragement. We experience disabling discouragement when we are overwhelmed by problems and pressures, which drain us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. It drains our strength. It paralyzes us to a certain effect. We don't want to do anything. We just want to just wallow in what we're going through. We talked about the cause of discouragement. At the base of every experience of discouragement is a lie. A lie that comes from Satan. Whether we're experiencing a type of fear along with it, unbelief, or bitterness, self-pity, or condemnation, they're all based upon Satan lies. And the root cause of us receiving Satan's lie is because we take down the shield of faith. If we lose sight of God's word, if we lose sight of our resources in God, we remove our spiritual protection that Christ has provided for us. Now, what do I do then if, I, if I'm feeling discouraged? Well, number one, I want you to remove any guilt. Remove any guilt. Remove guilt by, re by repenting and confession. Repent of any known sin. <clears throat> Confess anything that's outside of the boundaries of God's word. Satan loves to try to use past failures to keep us from removing guilt and dealing with discouragement. If you remember in the story of David, he faced difficulty when his son Absalom was going crazy. And because of his past failure and sin with Bathsheba, Satan used this to make it difficult for David to bring discipline to his son. Don't live in the past. If you have confessed it, let it go, and move on with your life in the power of God's word for the moment. So the first thing, remove any guilt. Second, take up the shield of faith. The Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith to quench, here we go, all of the fiery darts of the wicked one. Not just one or two, but all of the fiery darts. Now what are you saying? The wicked one is going to send many fiery darts our way. And the shield of faith will catch them all. Yes. Pastor, how do I then take up the shield of faith? You got to learn God's Word, saints. You have to learn God's word. 
God's word, God's truth. When you recognize Satan's lies, you're alone. You're not going to be victorious. You're not coming through this. This is going to be the end. This is going to be the worst. I'm going to get you this time. You thought you made it, but it's over with. You have to combat Satan's lies with the word of God. Take up the shield of faith. What do you do when Satan tells you God has left us? You've got to bring Hebrews 13 and 5 on the scene when God says, I will never leave you. All right. <clears throat> what do you do when he tell you no good will come from this? You've got to come together with Romans 8, verse 28 and 29 and understand that all things work together for the good. Mm -hmm. When he tell you you can't trust people no more, people will only hurt and use you. You've got to come back with Ephesians 6 and 12 and tell him, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. People are not my problem. When Satan wants to tell you the people are your problem, you've got to let him know. The word says people are not my problem. You're my problem. Amen. Jesus, Jesus. When Satan tells you that God is punishing you because of something you've said and done in the past, well, you got to tell him, according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 to 11, if he's chastised him, it's because he loves me. The word God says, for whom he loveth, he chasteth. And his correction is for my good. When he tell you you're weak, and you're going to fail because you're weak, you've got to tell him, according to 1 Corinthians 12 and 9, my strength is made possible because of the Lord. You got to combat all of his lies with truth. Take that. We got to get serious about this. If you you want to come out of depression, you want to come out of this curse, you got to come serious with the word of God. No song is going to do it. Turning on your gospel station, that's not going to get it. You got to come with the word of God. Turning on Christian radio is not going to get it. You got to come with the word of God. Amen. Make up the shield of faith, number two. Number three, learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. When David faced his greatest calamity just days before he was established as the king, according to 1 Samuel 36, he had to sit down by the brook and encourage himself. He had to rehearse in his own mind what God had done for him in the past. Yes. Satan often brings us to the greatest discouragements just before God fulfilled our expectation, just before the breakthrough. Jesus. And it is for this reason we are never to give up. The Word of God says in Galatians 6 and 9, we shall reap if we faint. What? Now, let me say that again. I only had a couple people to recite that with me. We shall reap if we faint not. But how do I encourage myself? You encourage yourself by allowing God's spirit to commune with your spirit once again through the word. And going through the Psalms is the best way to encourage yourself. Don't allow your mind, your will, or your emotions to communicate to yourself. Don't listen to self-talk. But rather make every effort to allow God's spirit through his word communicate to your spirit. When you find yourself failing in sin, go to Psalms 32 and 51. Read Psalms 32 and Psalm 51 and make those Psalms personal for you. <clears throat> when you find yourself facing rejection, read Psalms 35 and 55. When you find yourself and people are talking about you and slandering against you, read Psalms 38 and 59, the book of Psalms, the best book to help us to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Meditate on God's word night and day. Meditate on his word before you go to sleep. Why? Because it's usually in the nighttime that you face the most intense discouragement. It's at night when you're about to go to sleep. Or he'll wake you up in the middle of sound sleep and your mind is just roaming with all kind of ideas and you're wondering where did this come from? I mean all kind of imagination you didn't have before you went to sleep. Immediately pull out the book 
and begin to read scripture. Read to yourself. Get to a place where you can say the words out loud and you can hear yourself saying the word. Why? Faith comes by hearing and hearing what? The word of God. You got to get serious about this. Number four, establish a place to be alone with God. You need your own personal Bethel. Your own personal times with the Lord. When you are away from the telephone, from, from other distractions, from the television, from, from the radio, you need to have this place, this closet, where you can be with God and no distractions and talk to Him honestly from your heart. Number five, remove yourself from fearful people. Remove yourself from negative people. One of God's requirements for service in the army of Israel was not to be fearful. A fearful person will spread his fear among others and make them fearful. Learn how to connect with people who will keep you in the scriptures. Learn how to connect with people who will encourage you. Number six, learn how to read. Read Christian biographies that tell of great faith. Book I read about 12 times, and then time I find myself in the in a moment of discouragement, I pull up my biography of George Mueller. George Mueller, the great German who preached in England and found an orphanage for over 22,000 young people. When he found himself at the end of the road, he kept on kept on preaching and kept on searching and God would answer his prayer every time. Read, I read that over and over again and somehow no matter how many times I read it I come away with full of faith. Whenever I get an opportunity I go down to Pensacola and I walk on that campus and I see faith in action. I see the faith of a husband and wife team who said this city must have a place where we can educate our children in a way that pleases the Lord. And I look and just walk over that area and see that all that God has done. Let me know God is yet faithful to his word. I'm encouraged. Read about Christians who have gone through and have been encouraged. So you just can't stay in front of the TV and watch the news on TV and CNN and, 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 and read all the trashy magazines and, and look at all the reality shows and all the other stuff that's on TV and you're talking about you discouraged. You're going to be discouraged. I'm discouraged. Seems like every day somebody's getting killed. Somebody's getting shot. No matter where you go. That's right. Oh, it's getting, it's getting worse. Yes, it is. It's worse in our own city. We are slowly becoming the murder capital of these United States. Right here in our own area. Everywhere, everywhere. It was all over the world. We got to learn how to get into the book. And read the book and read about good Christians who have made it through much more difficult times than we are having. Read Christian biographies. Yes. Number seven, always avoid making major decisions when you are discouraged. It's so easy for Satan to get us to make major decisions during times when we're not thinking clearly or when we're not responding by faith. Never doubt in the darkness what God has shown you in the light. Galatians 6 and 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in... For in what? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. What was that little word, for in? Yes. Now, the thing is, you don't know when the due season is. Right. We want to tell God, now is my due season. But God said, you don't know when the due season is. Mm -hmm. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if. Here's the cause. If we faint not. Number eight, overcome the pride of not telling our authorities and families and friends that we are discouraged and that we need the prayers of others. Get away from this prideful feeling that I don't need to tell nobody I'm going through something. How you doing? Oh, I'm on top of the world. I'm the favor of God, highly blessed, however they say it. I'm highly blessed in favor of the Lord. I, I, I'm just walking on cloud with Jesus. And your insides are just tore up. I'm going to be honest. That's true. Amen. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of a little discouraged today. Can you pray with me? Jesus, Jesus. Can you pray with me? I, I, I had a student that made my week uh, on Friday. He came in before he started school. 
He said, Pastor, I need you to pray with me back. At the end of the devotion, can you stay back and I need you to pray with me? I'm going through something in my mind today. Can you pray with me? Just, just to have the student come and say, can you pray with me? Just to be honest. Amen. And we need to get that. We want everybody in the church to know we well. We got it going on. We don't want nobody to know that we're going through. We want to keep everything a secret. And we really, we need the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the righteous. How much? I need you to pray. But I can't pray if I don't know you're going through something. There's no, there's no harm in saying, saints, I need you to pray for me. I, you know, uh, I'm facing something and uh, the unknown can kind of make me anxious at times. I believe God and I know what God can do. I've seen him do it many times, but uh, but this kind of got me a little shaky. Just, 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 just pray with me. That's all. Just pray with me. There's no harm in that. So, but see, pride keeps you from doing that. So. Pride don't want you to tell nobody. Number nine, focus on God's reputation. Focus on God's reputation. When you're discouraged, it's very important to evaluate whose reputation will suffer the more. Ours or God. See, if our reputation suffers, it means that our concerns are for our program and the things that we can't change. But see, if you are sure of God's reputation, you're doing what God has told you to do, you have confessed on sin, God said he's going to be there, he's going to deliver you, you have to understand God is going to protect his own reputation. God's word is not going to come back to him void. God is not going to lie. If he said he's going to come through, he's going to come through. you got to believe that. you got to continue to articulate that until he comes through. Amen. Number 10, focus on your position in Christ. Focus on your position in Christ. Consider what Christ endured in order to glorify God and to secure our salvation. Know your resources. Because we are in Christ, we're able to enter into Christ's victory over Satan. God doesn't ask you to get independent victory over Satan. Our victory over Satan is in Christ. Christ Jesus. We have to establish this victory by quoting Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 through 11 and using the word discouragement for sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to be discouraged that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to Satan's discouragement live any longer therein? Focus on our position in Christ. Number 11. Offer up a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise to God. Refuse to talk about the negative. Begin to talk about how thankful you are to God. It's important for us to recall God's blessings to us and to thank God for all that he's done. When King Jehoshaphat and the army sang and praised the Lord, what did God do? God set an ambush against their enemy. There is power in thanksgiving. There is power in praise. Number 12, please, remember the principle of the birth, death, and the fulfillment of a vision that God has given you. God is the one who has given us a vision of how we can be effectively used by him. God will make sure that his vision in us will come to pass. And then number 13, Ask God how he can use your present situation for his glory. Ask God how he can use your present situation. What you and I are going through right now, ask God, God, how can you use this to expand the kingdom of God? You get that? You got all 13 of those. I know Sister Carmen did. So if you didn't get them at the church, see Sister Carmen. Don't ask me for Don't ask me for one. Sister Carmen got them all. Sister Carmen got every scripture. I said she called them all. Sister Carmen took the van into they write real quick and fast. Okay, you got that. Let's get out of discouragement. Amen. Walk in victory. All right, now let's fill in our outline. Come on, good man, let's go through this and get our outline. We've already touched on all the points. So, 
We said, number one, that all God's servants go through difficult times. But we said that God is faithful toward his servants. God is faithful to raise up godly co-workers. And we saw this in who were the godly co-workers that God raised up for Paul? Priscilla and Priscilla, thank you. God is faithful to provide funds for his work. How did God provide funds for Paul? Thank you from the churches of Macedonia. God provided the funds. And then let us see. God is faithful to bring converts even in the face of opposition. How did we see God bringing uh, converts uh, even in Corinth during this time of discouragement? Very good, very good, very good. It allowed Christmas, the ruler of the synagogue, to get saved, to be an encouragement to Paul. All right, we got this? Yes, let's move on. All right, God is faithful to confirm his presence, his protection, and his purpose. The Lord confirmed his presence. The Lord confirmed his protection. How did, God, how did God confirm his presence to Paul? He told him the vision. What did he tell him in the vision to confirm his presence? He said, I am with you. Okay, and how did he confirm his protection? He said, nobody's going to harm you. Nobody. How did he confirm his purpose? Don't stop speaking. Don't stop speaking, but I got many people in this city. God is faithful in spite of apathy. The apathy of government and hostile enemies. They even took trying to take Paul to court. But God raised up somebody in the court who saw this as foolishness and would not even entertain that. You've got to have faith in God. Doing what's right, confessing sin, God will protect you. Then number three, God's servants should be faithful in serving him in spite of difficulties. In spite of difficulties. You got that sentence? Amen. All right. 